We got to the Hanoi Hilton. Four of us rode in on a truck one afternoon, November the 22nd, 1967. And we went to a part of the camp called Little Vegas. It's in the top left-hand corner there. You have to name things, and since most fighter pilots in the Air Force had gone through Las Vegas, Nellis Air Force Base, they named the different wings of the Hanoi Hilton after the casinos in Las Vegas. So I went to one called the Thunderbird. They're all different names, and Stardust and Desert Inn, all the old casinos that most of them have been destroyed now. But those were the big ones of our day. Once we got in there, we were put in a small cell. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. But I want to tell you what they were after. Their goal was to break the POW. They wanted military information if they could get to you right away. They wanted compliance, as anybody who runs a prison wants compliance. What they really wanted, though, was propaganda. They wanted to use us as a tool against America in the war. And they wanted to make it to indoctrinate us so they could get willful cooperation if they could. They wanted us to agree with them and make anti-war propaganda. Our goals were to live up to the Code of Conduct. Six articles, very powerful for building a culture. To minimize the loss to the U.S. and to keep the faith with our fellow POWs in our country and ultimately return with honor. This idea of return with honor was boiled down over, it was really there from the start, but it wasn't really codified till we'd been there a year or two. Initially, it was resist, survive, return with honor. And then eventually, it really, the three words, return with honor, captured everything. It was our mission, our vision, and it captured our values, so who we were and what we were about. And what was so great about it was we had some great leaders to show the way, and I'm going to tell you about some of those. The strategy they came up with was take torture to resist. You couldn't go along with them. To realize that you could be broken and you would be broken because they were broken and you wanted to minimize the enemy's net gain to bounce back after you've given in to something, not what they want, but something at some point, and then stay united through communications. Now, as I talk through these and as you watch this, listen to how this applies to everyday life and into the stories in all of our lives and the stories we're still living. Whether it's our health, our children, our grandchildren, these same things that we applied in the POW camps really apply everywhere. Reisner's guidance, he built the culture. He says, I'm in charge and here's what I want you to do. Great leadership, real clear. Be a good American, live up to the code of conduct, resist up to the point of losing physical or mental you know, capabilities, losing, having the damage there. And then give them something but no more, give as little as possible, and then bounce back, bounce back to resist again. And stay united through communications. Pray every day and go home proud. Real basic, very powerful. That was all we needed to know. And then there was Commander James Bond Stockdale, Medal of Honor leader. When Reisner went in to torture and was out of commission and out of communication, Stockdale stepped up and took over, and you never missed a beat. You got a slightly different personality, but the same code, the same, code the same culture, the same leadership, knock down, bounce back, knock down, bounce back, time and again. And he won the Medal of Honor because uh, after doing several things to avoid meeting with a propaganda press conference, he finally took the stool, the wooden stool in the, in the interrogation room and beat his face and his head till it was a pulp and they couldn't use him in the propaganda movie that they were trying to create. Incredible leader. Well, we built cohesive teams. This is back in the Hanoi Hilton in 1970 after the Sante raid. We have over almost 400 people all in one area called Camp Unity, and we went into room cells that were about 25 by 70 feet with 50, 40 to 55 guys in each one. Now we really get organized. But the great thing was we had cohesion. We, had, uh, we worked together well. We didn't have any fights or anything like that. We got along well. Uh, at this time, because so many of you had 
raised so much cane with the communists in Paris and around the world by wearing bracelets. Anybody here wear a bracelet? Look around the room. Look at all those bracelet wearers. Thank you so much for what you did. Those bracelets and all those letters you wrote to the Paris delegation from North Vietnam, the North Vietnamese delegation, it made a difference. Because in late 1969, one other thing happened. Two things married up together. People in the U.S. raising hell and giving them a black eye, which they didn't like because they wanted good propaganda, not bad propaganda. And Ho Chi Minh died. And they got a new regime in in Hanoi, and they came in, they quit torture one day, and pretty much quit, for the most part, for the rest of the time we were there. The amount of solids in the soup went up, the food got better, Uh, they actually gave us some aspirin occasionally, and if you had a stomachache, they might give you a sulfur pill, and it went much more to live and let live, and that's why we were able to come home. We had another two years there, two and a half years. That's why we were able to come home in such good shape, because we had time to decompress, to deal with our anger, for the most part, and to come home without a lot of bitterness, because we had time to think it through and know that bitterness would ruin us, but wouldn't hurt the communists. Thank you all for what you did to help us make it through that experience. A couple things on reflection. Leadership made a huge difference. I'm so proud of this committee and all of you all and what you've done and what you are doing, leadership always makes a difference. That's the leader's responsibility is to make a difference. And it sure did for us up there. Communications kept us aligned. You have to communicate and you have to over communicate the message. Courage enables leadership with honor. There's no way you can lead with honor without a lot of courage. Leading with honor, living with honor, is not easy. It's always the temptation to take a shortcut. And that's one thing we in the military have been trained not to take shortcuts about the most important things. And there's a consequence of taking shortcuts. Sometimes you get caught and sometimes you don't. As I've been a leadership consultant coach for 15 years. Almost every issue I've seen when a leader gets in trouble is because they have fears and doubts, and they don't lean into the pain of their fears to do the right thing. We had strong faith. We had faith in each other. We had faith in our families. We had faith in our country, that you wouldn't leave us there. We had faith in God, a lot of praying. And for me, you know, I grew up in a great Christian home down in Georgia, and I knew not only were my parents praying, but everybody in the community and the churches around there, and sure enough, they were. And that prayer really carried me along. And faith that we would return, that we could do it, that we would return with honor. As we face our nation where we are today, and we think what our biggest challenges are, whether it's in business, in our schools, in athletics, in leadership, or in politics. The real issue is, for us, it was return with honor. For our country today, it's to live and lead with honor. And living and leading with honor means doing the right thing. You know in your gut what's right. And to do that thing, you have to lean into the pain. And until we can get people to understand that it's not about me, it's others above self, it's duty above my own agenda, and have the courage to do that and live that way, until we get that as our own culture that we're all living in, we're going to have significant problems. In the Atlanta school system, we've got teachers that are cheating on the test. Not students. Teachers are cheating on standardized tests. And this and the Atlanta Papers did a survey and had a statistician run tests, and they believe this is happening in most major cities. So when the teachers are cheating, we've got something wrong with our culture. When the coach at Ohio State who's written books on character lies in face of his contract, we've got problems with character. Ladies and gentlemen, you in this crowd, you know 
what it means to live and lead with honor. You've been trained. You do that every day. You're volunteers. You're doing that. That message needs to go out. We need to stand up and say this message and hold people accountable to this message of living and leading with honor in the days ahead. I'm excited about who you are and about being with you tonight. And I just want to challenge you to remember the leaders in the POW camps. When you're having a rough day, when you know someone, a leader, who thinks you think may be wavering in having the courage to do what they ought to do, remind them about Reisner and Stockdale and Denton and many others in those POW camps and what they sacrificed in order to do the right thing. And challenge them, can they stand up to the test? and lead with honor.